On that July morning in 2019, the residents of Utica, New York were getting ready for the traditional Boilermaker race. It seemed like nothing was out of the ordinary, but around 7 a.m., a disturbing call came into 911. The dispatcher immediately sent patrol cars to Post Street, where some crime had allegedly taken place. This street is a typical dead end, stretching from west to east off Culver Avenue and ending in a wooded park area. The officer who arrived at the scene saw a black SUV parked there and next to it a man lying on the ground in a pool of blood. Right before the cop's eyes, this guy suddenly tried to cut his throat while simultaneously attempting to take a gruesome selfie. The policeman also noticed a body covered with a tarp next to the Jeep. Judging by the outline, it was a woman. The young man was frantically shouting that he had killed his girlfriend and was going to follow her. The responding officers managed to stop the suicide attempt and call for medics. The injured man was taken to St. Elizabeth's Hospital with serious neck wounds. The surgeons did their job, stitched up the wounds, and stabilized his condition. To be honest, I've seen all sorts of things in my career, but for someone to try to commit suicide in broad daylight, right in front of a cop, while filming it, that didn't happen often. It was obvious that this guy had just committed a horrific murder and was possibly in some inadequate state of mind. Initially, law enforcement did not disclose the identities of the people involved in this gruesome event. However, information about what had happened began spreading on the internet very quickly. As it turned out, a young man named Brandon Clark managed to post a series of shocking photos on his Instagram account shortly after the incident. These images showed a prone vehicle and a dead girl who was nearly decapitated. In one frame, her face and upper body could be seen. In another, Clark's bloody hand with the words, Sorry, Bianca. Then his account was deleted. But Brandon didn't stop with just Instagram. On his profiles on other social networks, he continued to publish disturbing content. For example, there was a photo where his bloody hand reached out to a body covered with a tarp with that same inscription, Sorry, Bianca. Also, a selfie with a neck wound and the caption, Goodbye. Moreover, after posting his last Instagram story, Clark added the date of his own death, July 14, 2019. Eventually, the administration of the internet platform stopped the spread of these horrible images. But while the official authorities remained silent, internet users had already managed to identify the deceased girl she turned out to be Bianca Devins, who had several social media accounts. Based on rumors and speculation, people began to construct the most incredible theories about the events. Local online communities were literally boiling with discussions. Emotions were polarized from sincere sympathy to cynical mockery. Groups even appeared that lured people in with promises of shocking content allegedly. Those very scary photos that Clark had published in Messengers were available there. I will not retell all the speculation and conjecture that swirled around this case. Let's move straight to the facts and examine the key figures in this tragedy. I'll tell you everything now, but only to those wonderful people who have just subscribed to the channel like this video and left any comment below so that this video is seen by as many people as possible. Because this story is a prime example of how social media can instantly spread information about a crime, even when official sources are still silent. And how difficult it can be to separate truth from fiction and rumors in this flood of information. The victim of this horrific crime was 17-year-old Bianca Meshek Devins. She had just graduated from high school and applied to a local college, intending to study psychology. And by all indications, this choice was not accidental. The girl's life was not cloudless. Back in 2010, problems began in her family between her parents. Constant loud quarrels and Bianca's mother even filed domestic violence reports several times, but then withdrew them. For the girl, who was the youngest child in the family, all of this became a serious emotional upheaval. At school, Bianca was diagnosed with a whole host of mental disorders, depression, anxiety, borderline personality disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. In 2015, her father finally left the family, which did not improve the girl's condition at all because she loved her dad very much and had a warm relationship with him. This event only deepened her psychological problems. Her mother took Bianca to several specialists, but there was no noticeable progress. It got to the point where the girl began having panic attacks right at school and even had to be briefly admitted to a specialized clinic. After that, Bianca switched to homeschooling and here the amazing world of the internet opened up before her in all its glory. On Instagram, she had only about 2,000 followers. However, in the specific community of the 4chan image board, the girl gained much more popularity. This site, as you may know, is a gathering place for very peculiar people with specific slang and subculture. 
They say there aren't that many girls there, and those that are usually fit certain stereotypes, white, big-eyed anime fans. However, let's not dwell on the peculiarities of 4chan now. Rumor had it that Bianca even sold some of her revealing photos to her fans there, and some even showed screenshots of correspondence supposedly confirming this. But there is no certainty about this. Nevertheless, classmates generally characterize Bianca as a pleasant, albeit somewhat quirky girl. Unfortunately, sad statistics indicate that very often, problematic behavior and mental disorders in adolescence are rooted in family troubles and traumas. Although I admit, I'm hearing about the subculture of this 4chan for the first time. I'll have to ask our experts about this. Bianca's ex-boyfriend said that at first their relationship was wonderful, but later the girl began to show jealousy and hysterics for any reason. Although in my opinion, these changes in her behavior could well coincide with the exacerbation of her mental disorders. Some of Bianca's acquaintances noted that she was too straightforward in communication, especially with guys. Later, another interesting character appeared in the girl's life, an online friend who began to persistently court her and even stalk her in real life. This story lasted about two years and nearly drove Bianca to s died. At least, that's what she told her doctor, who sent her for treatment at a specialized inpatient facility. However, on the eve of the tragedy, the girl's life seemed to have settled down. The violent mood swings were behind her. She looked to the future with optimism and even joked, recalling the last few years of her life. As for Brandon Andrew Clark, his biography was also not easy. The guy grew up in an unstable family where his father created an extremely tense atmosphere. When Brandon was about 12 years old, his father held him and his mother hostage for several hours, threatening them with a knife. Then the police settled the situation and the boy was placed in the care of a foster family. At the time of the tragic events, Clark had just turned 21. He lived in the town of Bridgeport, not far from Utica, where Bianca lived less than an hour's drive. The young people met on Instagram a few months before the incident, first just communicating and then meeting in person. Bianca even met Brandon's family, and he made an impression on them as a polite and caring guy. His friends also generally described Clark as a good person who was into fitness and anime. But there was one alarming fact Brandon turned out to be a lot. It's not surprising that in Bianca's case, these problems coincided with the exacerbation of her condition. But the story with the online stalker is already an alarming bell. Unfortunately, virtual stalkers are a real scourge of our time, and I'm afraid to even imagine what the girl had to go through during these two years. Yes, let's take a little detour and figure out what this lol is. The internet explains this term as a combination of the words lolita and complex. In Japan, it refers to sex attraction to prepubescent or early pubescent girls or those who look like them externally. In essence, it's a type of perversion with children. I won't go into details if you're interested, Google it yourself. And here we come to a delicate moment in Clark's biography. It turns out that when he was 16, he corresponded online with a 12-year-old girl. Brandon's friends who knew about this tried to stop him, but he brushed them off, saying he would deal with it himself. So certain alarm bells were already ringing even then. Let's return to Brandon's relationship with Bianca. That summer, they had already become quite close and spent a lot of time together. On Saturday, July 13, 2019, the couple planned to attend a Nicole Dollenganger concert in New York. They arrived at the venue around 7.30 p.m. Before the event, they smoked marijuana with an acquaintance in his car and went to the concert. And there, a sudden quarrel broke out between them. And the reason is that Brandon saw Bianca meet and joyfully greet some Alex, her old acquaintance. As it later turned out, he was one of her numerous online friends. The girl instantly switched all her attention to this Alex, ignoring Clark. And a little later, Brandon saw the two of them kissing. After the concert, the enraged Clark drove Bianca back to Utica. The whole way, he tried to sort things out, but the girl just fell asleep in the car. Then the guy, already in the city, stopping on the dead-end post street, continued to express his indignation at her frivolous behavior. Why didn't anyone turn to the school psychologist or social services? His friends tried to stop him, but is that enough? As for Brandon's jealousy at the concert, of course, seeing your girlfriend flirting or kissing someone else is unpleasant for anyone. But his reaction still seems somewhat excessive, unhealthy. According to Clark's testimony, during that fateful conversation on Post Street, Bianca stated that everything was over between them, that she was no longer interested in him, and that she had never promised him mutual love. These words seemed to finally destroy Brandon's already fragile psyche. He grabbed a large knife with a black handle and inflicted fatal wounds on the girl. He filmed this entire horrific process on his phone. 
Leaving Bianca's body in the car, Clark got out, gathered some branches and started a fire. And then he got busy actively posting on social media. He logged into the girl's Instagram account and published a photo of her mutilated body there. Of course, shocked subscribers quickly noticed the picture, but at first they took it for some kind of sick joke. However, when Brandon uploaded a few more fresh photos of the murdered girl to Discord, it became clear that this was not a prank. Someone did notify the police, but there was too little information for immediate action. Meanwhile, Clark sent messages to his relatives, briefly saying goodbye. It looked like suicide notes. Then he threw his laptop into the fire. He called Bianca's family home and coldly reported that he had killed their daughter. And around 7.21 a.m. he himself contacted the 911 dispatcher and said, I killed my girlfriend, giving his location. While the police were rushing to the scene, Brandon managed to scrawl something like, You will never forget me on the ground with a stick, lay down next to the body under the tarp, prepared a knife and phone and waited. You already know what happened next. The very next day, Brandon was charged with intentional murder. Cops carefully studied his online activity and found out that he was literally obsessed with Bianca Devins. He constantly Googled her name, monitored social networks, saved her photos, bombarded her with messages. Clark even tattooed an image of a girl on a swing on his leg, Bianca's personal symbol. There was also a theory that he might have drugged and used her sexually. But this assumption remained unconfirmed. Unfortunately, the finale of this meeting turned out to be tragic. Of course, hearing such things from a girl was painful, but can it be an excuse for murder? And such a brutal one with filming the whole process. This is clearly something much deeper than just jealousy or anger over rejection. There are already signs of a truly unhealthy obsession, persecution mania and control. And these creepy posts on social media, as if he was bragging about what he had done. But this assumption remained unconfirmed. Meanwhile, social networks were exploding with heated discussions. Most users were shocked by this horrific story. But oddly enough, on the infamous 4chan image board, there were those who praised Clark and mocked the tragedy. The gruesome photos posted by Brandon on Facebook and Instagram quickly spread across the internet. The scale of distribution was such that the administration of the resources was forced to add these images to digital fingerprints and block publications based on them. For a while, even Discord servers had to be shut down. But despite all the efforts of the moderators, these materials can still be found on 4chan upon request. The cynicism and surrealism of the situation are striking. Having just committed a brutal murder, Clark does not flee or hide, but begins to flaunt his crime on social media. He posts gruesome photos, sends farewell messages to relatives, throws evidence butts into the fire, as if playing some kind of perverted game. And at the same time, he presents himself as almost a romantic hero, carving a message for the victim on the ground. The reaction of some users on image boards, who literally mock the memory of the deceased girl, is also disturbing. As for Brandon's obsession indeed, his behavior has all the signs of morbid stalking and obsessive mania. Constantly tracking the victim online, collecting her photos, tattooing her personal symbols. Although the version with drug so far remains unproven. However, all this is yet to be thoroughly investigated. There's a lot of work ahead examinations, analysis of digital evidence, psychiatric evaluations. We will return to this high profile case in our chronicles more than once. In the meantime, I would like to once again express my sincere condolences to the family and friends of Bianca Devins, and to warn all our viewers, especially young girls, be extremely careful in virtual acquaintances, do not ignore alarming signals, do not be afraid to ask for help. Such obsession and inadequate behavior are a reason to sound the alarm. Unfortunately, this story is another proof that in our age of digital technology, danger can lurk where you don't expect it. During interrogations, Brandon Clark repeatedly claimed that he did not remember the details of the crime, referring to some kind of mental breakdown. But when investigators found the horrific murder video filmed by the suspect himself on his smartphone, his memory miraculously cleared up. Although he still did not admit guilt, it would seem that in December 2019, the guy should have been thinking about how to save his skin. But no, he managed to get into new trouble. Already in the Wanata County Jail, a shiv made from a toothbrush was found in Clark's cell. Now the charges were compounded by the distribution of prison contraband. Probably realizing that things were bad on February 10, 2020, Brandon did change his testimony to guilty. The court scheduled the sentencing for April 7. But as you might guess, the pandemic and quarantine restrictions got in the way. And what do you think? By the beginning of summer, Clark changed his mind again. 
On June 2nd, he sent a petition to withdraw his guilty plea. He said that his lawyer had forced him to make a deal with the investigation. But the judge, remembering that at the first hearings, the defendant had no complaints about his lawyer, rejected this ploy. Another attempt to hold a hearing took place on September 30, but the written decision was ready only by October 30, and again the announcement of the verdict was postponed, this time to December 8. However, there were already rumours that Clark was facing at least 25 years or even life. In the end, that's what happened. On March 16, 2021, Brandon Andrew Clark was sentenced to 25 years in prison. At that last hearing, he finally officially repented for what he had done. However, the psychologist involved in the case regarded the defendant's actions as a classic case of domestic violence. Provoked in their opinion by toxic masculinity and the desire to assert his power over the victim, and the head of the local Department of Criminology, Alison Margarski, added that Clark's behavior fully corresponds to the typical profile of a violent male criminal who feels wronged and deprived and therefore tries to assert himself through violence. You know, in my career, I've already seen so many suspects who forgot everything and then suddenly remembered everything. You see, video evidence of their crimes is a kind of 21st century know-how. There was no such thing before. But I admit, even I was struck by the fact that Clark managed to cause trouble with a shiv while already in jail. This clearly indicates his personality. I hope that during these long years behind bars, Brandon Clark will rethink his life and actions. Although who knows, time will tell. However, I promise we will return to the analysis of this chilling and instructive case in our next issues more than once. After all, such stories make us wonder how to protect young people from terrible mistakes, how to notice the alarming signals, how to prevent new tragedies. We must seek these answers. I consider it my social mission to tell you about such cases. This is not just true crime. This is in fact my social responsibility. If you have listened to this point, I am very grateful to you and I am sure that now you will be more careful with your children. But this is not the end yet. Section nine. It turns out that this horrific story did not end there. In July, 2021, more than a year after the tragedy, Bianca's family filed a lawsuit against the Wanata County Prosecutor's Office. What is the essence of their claim? According to the plaintiffs, the district attorney himself or one of his subordinates deliberately leaked video recordings from the killer's phone to the internet. And most disgustingly, it was an intimate video featuring Clark and the underage Bianca. These scandalous footage somehow made it to the air of several local TV channels. They also made it to the national show 48 Hours on CBS. Moreover, one YouTube blogger also got hold of this video. From a legal point of view, the lawsuit qualifies the actions of the prosecutor's office as the illegal distribution of a child's intimate video, which is terrible. It's hard to say how this litigation will end. One thing is clear the prosecutor's office will not give up easily. We will have to wait for official comments. But the very fact of such a leak, and even more so from the materials of a criminal case, is a terrible blow to the already traumatized family. Detective Brooks over the long years of service in the police, I've seen all sorts of things. But this case just knocks me off track. The brutal murder of a young girl, the broadcast of all this on social networks, a criminal obsessed with obsession. And now there's also a leak of such sensitive content. Did someone in the prosecutor's office want hype or sensation? You know, video recordings from the phones of the persons involved are a very specific type of evidence. On the one hand, they can shed light on the details of the crime, add strokes to the psychological portrait of the suspect. But on the other hand, it is always very personal, intimate information. And the leak of such data can cause irreparable damage to the reputation and dignity of both the victims and their loved ones. I'll be frank if these accusations are confirmed, it will be a real shock for me personally, because it undermines trust in the system as a whole. I want to believe that the investigation will put everything in its place. But even now, before its completion, I sympathize with Bianca's family. To survive such grief, such a loss, and to find yourself at the center of a new scandal. I can't imagine where they find the strength. Therefore, I once again urge everyone who is listening to or watching us now be careful. Remember that even your smartphone can hide a terrible weapon. Share personal information very selectively. And for our part, we will do everything to ensure that such tragedies do not happen again. And so that criminals are punished and the rights of victims and their loved ones are securely protected both online and offline. Thank you, I love you, and yes, please subscribe and leave a comment. Well, that's it, bye-bye. Did you like it?